Hello friends, welcome to the Cold War Prepper. My name is Lee. Uh, there's been an awful lot of commotion uh, recently uh, concerning the public service announcement that was put out by the City of New York. Uh, reference the, the three steps to uh, protect yourself from fallout. First, get inside as soon as possible. Second, uh, stay inside and, and get, get rid of any clothes that may have been exposed to radioactive dust, which we call fallout. And uh, third, stay in there until you're given the all clear to come out. Um, and I, I know a lot of people have been debunking that, and it's based on emotions and not on facts. So let's let's start back at the very beginning. And, and there are two types of weapons that, that we have to be concerned with. And I think people are getting confused between the two of them. Uh, the first one is going to be a, a uh, nuclear weapon itself, and that's going to be a warhead uh, that's delivered either through a missile, a bomb, a suitcase, a torpedo, uh, we had nuclear mines up until 1986. I mean, we call them area den denial munitions. So there were all kinds of different ways we can deliver a thermonuclear warhead or a nuclear warhead. Uh, but we're counting on the explosiveness of that reaction. Uh, and that's what it magnifies everything, you know, and that's what creates the fireball. Uh, and then there's the other type, which is called a dirty bomb. Now, a dirty bomb is nothing more than, let's say, a truck full of ammonia uh, that you're going to use as the explosive or, or a truck full of uh, gunpowder or a truck full of any other TNT or anything like that. Normal explosives. And then let's say that the person went to a nuclear power plant and stole the radioactive rods uh, from their, uh, that, that had been expended and they still had some radioactivity to them. So now they're going to take those radioactive rods and put those around the explosives, the high explosives, so that when it explodes, what they're doing is they're taking those radioactive elements and throwing them into the community. Now, the thing is with a dirty bomb, it's not going to have the same distance or effect as a nuclear uh, bomb but it is going to have a longer lasting effect and there's a reason behind that. So now we can go back to the nuclear bombs and talk about those. So the first thing I want you to do is if you see one, you're blind, okay? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's 10 times brighter than the sun. And so uh, that, that first uh, explosion, the white light, is if, if you're looking directly at it, you're blind. Uh, that's all there is to it. But if you see the, the cloud, but not the explosion, then hold your thumb up. And if you can, if you can cover the uh, uh, mushroom cloud with your thumb, then you're outside of the normal blast zone. So you don't have to worry about being uh, knocked over or put on fire or anything like that. All you have to do is, is hurry up and get inside an area and then wait for possible uh, nuclear fallout radiation, uh, radioactivated uh, dust particles to fall on you. Uh, so once if you get inside, you're pretty safe. Uh, typically, uh, if you're at that distance, it's going to take anywhere to, up to about a half an hour for that radioactive fallout to reach you. But let's talk about how fallout exists in the first place. Uh, there are two types of bursts with a nuclear weapon. There's a ground burst and there's an air burst. Now, an air burst is usually anything higher than a quarter mile altitude uh, where it's going to explode. So what we say is at a quarter mile or higher, that explosion, that fireball of the explosion itself is probably not going to touch the earth. And so all you're going to have is the blast dynamics going into effect and you're not going to have any fallout from that. That's what we did at both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Both of those were air bursts at about a quarter of a mile to a half a mile in altitude above the city. And that's what um, uh, destroyed the city. Now, there was not that much radioactivity afterwards because it didn't actually irradiate any of the ground below it and throw it up into the air. If you have a ground burst where it's actually exploding on the surface of the earth, then it's digging up this crater and all that displaced soil and concrete or anything else is going up into the air with that mushroom cloud and it's going to be spread by the wind. And as it spreads downwind, of course, heat is what's keeping it aloft. As it cools, it will start falling down to earth. That's why you have this cone of radioactive fallout. Uh, so that's what you have to be prepared for downwind from a nuclear blast is if it's a surface burst, there will be nuclear contaminated fallout. Uh, if it's an air burst, there will be minimum nuclear fallout. So now let's talk about the delivery methods. Uh, I heard somebody saying that uh, tactical nukes are probably going to be uh, cruise, cruise missiles. And, and 
So I'll, let me let me separate that. And and you know, in my experience in the military, we had we had the uh, area denial munitions engineering company was actually in my brigade um, I, when they were when we discontinued that in 1986 in Germany. Uh, this was the 207th Military Intelligence Brigade, and we had the uh, area denial munitions for the brigade, which was basically a suitcase nuke. The reason we use nukes in combat, tactical nukes, is for area denial. Uh, if a, an element wants to attack through a, an area that is irradiated, they have to button up, which decreases their visibility and reaction capabilities. They have to go into what we call MOP4, or Military Oriented Protective Posture. That's a full suit, mask, goggles, gloves. You are so uncomfortable that you can barely fight. Your main goal is to get through it. That's what we want to do. We're going to use a tactical nuke to uh, protect an area so that the enemy, as they attack through it, makes themselves more of a target and easily killed by our normal forces. Very seldom am I aware of anybody using a tactical nuke in an offensive capability, although it can be done. The ones that I heard that uh, were offensive was we had tactical nukes in the Nike Hercules, which was... Uh, uh, an older 1960s, it was a second generation uh, surface to air missile. And the thought process was if they put a small nuclear warhead in there, that it could take out an entire uh, wing of bombers coming in if it was placed in the proper position. We also had nuclear depth charges and then we had nuclear torpedoes. And so those were, you know, we figured we could take out an entire area rather than just one specific target. <clears throat> but, you know, for usually for a a ground target, you're not going to have uh, that much of an offensive nature with a tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, those are going to be relegated to the strategic ones. So let's talk about, and, and let's take a look at, especially that cruise missile thought that that person had. Uh, in the U.S., we currently have 400 ICBMs, and that's the LGM-30 Minuteman II. They have a range of about 6,000 miles, and they fly at 15,000 miles per hour. Uh, 200 of those are, have 335 kiloton uh, W87 Mark 21 warheads, and 200 of them have 300 kiloton uh, Whiskey 78 Mark 12 warheads. And uh, so that's our 400 that we have in the ICBMs, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, then we have about uh, 400 bombers, uh, 300 of them stationed in three different bases here in the U.S., and then 100 are deployed to NATO. Uh, so with that, we have 46 B-52s, and uh, they're going to primarily launch the AGM-86 cruise missile with a 150 kiloton warhead. Now, we thought that the bombers would be uh, old and, and wouldn't be able to make it through the air defenses and everything else. But of course, with the introduction of the cruise missile, we have now a standoff capability. So that whereas you might have the air defense dome here and the B-52s fly up like this, then they launch the cruise missiles, which are smaller, harder to detect on radar and harder to intercept than the bomber itself. So that the B-52 can launch those or the B-1 or the B-2 can launch those, stand off and then come back and return to the U.S. Uh, 20 B-52s have uh, carry uh, 16, 1200 kiloton warheads. Uh, then we have submarine launch ballistic missiles. We currently have 14 Ohio class submarines and they carry 20, each one carries 20 Trident II. Uh, uh, war, uh, rockets, missiles, and now, okay, so real quick difference between a rocket and a missile. A rocket is not controlled, uh, a missile is. So a missile has some sort of a guidance system, and a rocket is free fall or, or free flight. So you aim it, you determine the characteristics of the burn, the altitude, wind resistance, and everything else. So you're going to adjust the angle, the altitude, and then you launch it. Once you launch it, you, once you launch it, there is no correction. Whereas with a missile, you're going to guide it somehow or other, whether that be through radio waves or, or fly-by-wire or something. But a missile is guided by some sort of guidance system. A rocket is free-flying. Um, so each of those 20 Trident IIs uh, on that submarine will have four or five MIRVs, uh, which is a multiple re-entry vehicle. So you launch one rocket, and it's got five shells, or if you will, five bombs, that be, then come down, and those are going to be the uh, Whiskey 88s at 475 kilotons. Uh, then we also have, um, uh, and those have a range of about 7,500 miles. 
So those are the ones that we do. We really, we need to be f most feared of is the submarines because you know we, they can really reach the interior of the United States a lot quicker if they're off the shores. Uh, so right now we have a couple E8 um, command and control planes up, and then those can uh, control those 12 uh, submarines, Ohio-class submarines, and they can also control the uh, 400B-52s. And what did I say? Let me get back to my notes so I don't give any false information. It's not 400 B-52, it's 400 ICBMs and uh, then a total of 400 aircraft, bomber aircraft, uh, 300 stateside and 100 over NATO. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are with that. Um, so, so those cruise missiles are actually strategic, they are not tactical. Uh, but anyhow, let's get back to the basics. And the basics are the information that New York City is putting out is very correct and very appropriate for the threats that we are currently facing, whether it be a nuclear onslaught through intercontinental ballistic missiles, through uh, BEARS, TU-12s flying in and delivering their cruise missiles, or whether it be through submarine uh, launched ballistic missiles, uh, that's very good information. Now, if you're outside, uh, of course, you know, and, and there is a direct detonation, you're inside the blast zone, then there's not too much you can do. You're gonna say goodbye. But remember, 25% of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were killed. 75% survived. So I think the same thing is going to happen in an all-out nuclear war. Uh, they're not going to go first round for big population centers. They're going to try to take out the, our submarines, our submarine bases, our air launch capabilities, our missile capabilities, and everything else. So I would say if you're close to a Minuteman II miss, uh, base, if you're close to uh, Dias Air Force Base, Whitman Air Force Base, or uh, Bozeman, no, not Bozeman, Minot, Minot Air Force Base up in North Dakota, I would say you have something to worry about. Uh, if you're close to one of our strategic submarine pens, like uh, down on the, on the border between Georgia and uh, South Carolina, uh, the 10th Submarine Squadron is down there. You know, So, I mean, those areas are probably going to be the first ones. They're probably going to try to take out command and control, take out the leadership and everything else. Maybe if there's a second wave, if our first wave doesn't take out their, their rockets and missiles, uh, then the second wave might come towards populated areas. But I don't think that's going to be a primary focus. So what can you do? I did a video earlier um, and I talked about personal protective equipment. Uh, get yourself a Ziploc bag, put yourself in a, a tight-fitting goggles. Uh, I, I use some uh, safety glasses, uh, fire, r firing range glasses. Uh, get yourself an N95 mask, get some nitrile gloves or some other kind of gloves that you can easily dispose of, and get yourself a, uh, a simple poncho. And, and I know people are saying painters, suits, and all this other stuff, but what you want is something that's very easy to take off. If you have radioactive dust on you, you want to get rid of it very quickly. And if you got to mess with zippers and everything else, then you're going to be exposing yourself to all that stuff that you're stirring up as you're trying to take it off. Whereas with a poncho, you can just basically take it by the hood, lift it up and take, throw it away, take your gloves off, take your hat off, take your uh, mask and, and uh, uh, goggles off, take a quick shower, you know, shoes and socks off and everything else. And you can get inside and you're going to be fairly well protected. So in that baggie, I want you to have uh, a disposable poncho. Uh, if you can get booties to cover your shoes, that would be fantastic, but it's not essential. Uh, get yourself some gloves and nitrile gloves, you know, medical nitrile gloves would be fantastic. N95 mask, some tight fitting goggles. Make sure you pull that uh, uh, hoodie for the poncho over your head. If you can get something like a uh, triangular bandage or some sort of thing to where you're fitting that uh, hoodie over your head very tightly so that none of that gets inside the poncho, much the better for you. So with that, uh, very wise information that the city of New York's putting out. Go ahead and duck, uh, get inside as soon as possible, remove any clothing that may have been exposed to radioactive dust, and then wait until you get an all clear signal. So the question that another person raised was, but won't EMP wipe out all the radios? Well, EMP is something that is effective at altitude. So what we found out was when you have a surface burst at a half a mile, uh, then let me get to my notes. Okay, a low altitude burst, one mile and less, will probably have an EMP effect of two to five miles or 3.2 to eight kilometers from the blast itself. So if you're more than five miles away from the blast zone, you're probably not going to have an EMP effect. 
<clears throat> so when do you have that major EMP effect? As the altitude of the explosion increases, then you've got all these rays going out and that's going to cover a greater area. So if it's an airburst where you're not worrying about any explosive uh, effects, and you're not working about, worrying about any um, fallout, that's where you're going to have the major EMP that can affect the entire nation and take out all the radios. So uh, just some things for you to think about. I just wanted to set some, some good information out there for you and uh, do your own research. You know, a lot of this is very good. I'm going to put a link down below to a, to a website, uh, nuke secrets, Nuclear Secrecy, uh, and it's a nuke map. So what you can do is you can take that map, plot your location, and then pick the warhead that you want and burst it and see what the what it's going to do as far as damages, fatalities, and everything else. Now, if you do an air burst, remember you're not going to have any fallout. If you choose to do a surface burst, it will give you, and you can select that option, uh, the fallout cone uh, for downwind from that nuclear burst. So play with that a little bit. See what, you know, take a look at some military targets close to where you live and use it to assess am I a th in, am I in, in, in a danger zone that I need to take extra special precautions and uh, what can I do to protect myself? So I hope that gives you a little bit of better understanding about what's going on. Uh, please do your own research. Remember, we're all in this together so we can come out the other end together. Togetherness is what counts. Take care. Bye-bye.